Hello there. Today we're up on the up in the California mountains again, mountain biking today. But today we're here to talk about your first century, your first American century, which would be a hundred miles, not a hundred kilometers. Hundred kilometers, sixty-four miles. So we're only going to be talking about a one hundred mile ride today, and that's a, that's what we call the century here in America. This is a this is a monumental task for most people, and a lot of people would say that's impossible for them. But the fact that um, I have the least amount of genetics that anybody could have possibly gotten to be an athlete, and I can do it, I would assume anybody can do it. Now, right from the start, <clears throat> I'm assuming that you're not on any medication, you don't have any health problems, you've already been checked out by your doctor with a stress test, so none of this advice applies if you're, if you're taking high blood pressure medicine, if you're diabetic. Um, it's up to your doctor to tell you, um, and maybe your physical therapist, what you can and can't do. This is, for, this is for people that are perfectly healthy and have been doing some kind of physical fitness, but, and you want to now expand on that and you want to actually go for the challenge. And this is a really a great challenge because it's not a competition against anybody else. It's not about how long it takes you. It's not how fast you ride it. It's, it's just a great challenge for yourself. And why is that? Because to be able to do this challenge, you're going to have to live a nice, pure lifestyle. And for anybody that likes to party and go out and drink a lot and do drugs, this ain't for them. I mean, you might be able to do it, but you may end up ruining your body or, or doing permanent damage to yourself by pushing yourself so hard beyond what your training and lifestyle supports. So for your first century, we're looking at... Uh, we're looking at 100 miles, and we're assuming that you already have some kind of fitness where you can go out and ride a bike maybe 25 miles without a problem. So, what's the first step? Well, the first step is, of course, you got to start with a bike that uh, that fits you and and that uh, will work on the terrain that you choose for your for your century, and that's the most important part. Twin between your equipment and the train that you're going to be riding your first century on, and that's something you would plan a year, two, or even three years ahead. The, uh, the terrain, if you live in the mountains and that's what you train in, then that's the century you want to ride. If you live in the flats and you're used to pushing heavy headwinds and uh, bas basically no hills, that's where you want to ride your first century. When you want to do another century after that, then, then try something else. But for your first century, make sure it's the same terrain as what you're training in and the same elevation, or at least, or at least within a thousand feet of the same elevation. So, we're looking for, this, we're looking for the, the terrain for your first century and we're looking for a bicycle to ride. Now, if you, if you look at my, some of my other videos, you'll see how to fit yourself to a comfort bike, to a hybrid bike, to a road bike. A mountain bike. These, uh, this is very important to get the correct fit right from the beginning. You don't want to start training your body in the wrong position. So you want to get as close to a perfect position as possible. And then with with century rides, the distance is so long. Other things besides your legs have to be taken into consideration. Your your neck. I mean, what angle are you going to be at when you're riding? Are you going to be straight up like this? If you're straight up. And no, the neck takes very little stress. Shoulders take very little stress. But then your butt takes all the weight, 100%. So now, you know, the right saddle and all this. And this is all the things you'll be experimenting with with this bicycle as you increase your mileage from month to month. So I'm, I'm not advising any kind of bike other than you, you want a bike that fits you. So if you like to sit straight up, give that a try. And because of the long distance, you're going to be looking for lots of hand positions. So if you're on a road bike, you, almost, you already, already automatically have those. You have, you have top the bars, you have over the brake hoods, and you have the drop bars. These give you three basic hand positions, which turn your hands from here 
to here to here. And each time you turn or articulate the arms, the shoulders are going to bear a slightly different weight. So check my uh, my other bike bike videos then, uh, and choose a bike that you might think would be good for you, and then make sure you get fit to it perfectly. And then we're going to go on into the physical training. And for first thing, none of this does any good without a pure lifestyle. So if you party a lot, if you're you like to drink and do drugs, then just don't do it. I mean. It's, it's a stupid challenge. It's, it's taking your body to the absolute limit that it may not be able to survive. You'll live through it, but you may end up with permanent knee damage or something, or who knows what's going to happen. The whole idea of writing your first century is the lifestyle that it takes to do that. And, it's, and, you may, and it shouldn't be just a one-time thing. You may never want to write another century again, but you take all the fitness and the lifestyle that took you up to that century, and you use it for your 50, your 40, your 60 mile rides from there on out. Or maybe you'll want to ride a century every, every week. That's something I used to do. You get so good at it that I would cruise along at 17 miles an hour, be done with it in six hours, because I would never stop. And uh, it was just a fun ride where there was support and people out on the road to talk to, and it was just fun. And doing 100 miles every week was no big deal. Okay, so back to training. So we're, we're talking about a pure lifestyle. That means the correct amount of sleep, absolute perfect nutrition, absolute perfect, which means you've got to cook your own food. Restaurant food is out of the question unless you have some kind of natural restaurant, but those are extremely rare. That means you're cooking your own food from natural ingredients, not from a frozen box or prepared food. This is something you go out and you buy your rice, you buy your broccoli, you buy your eggs, and you, you cook up your own rice, you steam your own broccoli, you, and you put your meal together from good, fresh, natural, organic food. And that'll be your power source. That's because recovery is what it's all about. You can stress your body every day, and that's, that's fine, but that's not what you call good training. And what we're talking about today is what I call intelligent training. And intelligent training is dealing with recovery. So if you go out and have a really hard ride where your heart rate is way up there, you're, maybe, you're, maybe you're doing mountain climbing too, and you go out for a 50-mile ride, and you come back just totally exhausted. Intelligent training would tell you the next day is a rest day. Now it can be a rest day on the bike. There is such a thing as just very low intensity, just kind of moving the pedals. And that's what I call recovery on the bike. And then there are just complete recovery days where you just stay off the bike completely, do some yoga, do some stretching. Uh, just no, no, no physical exertion that day. And it's up to you to decide, you know, which days are going to rest, which days, because there's all ki kinds of different techniques. You don't want to do exactly the same training every single week. You know, Monday is this, Tuesday is that. You change it up. Change it up all the time. Because the body loves consistency. It'll get used to the consistency, and then you won't, and then you won't be gaining anything anymore. So if you throw different training techniques or mix the things up every week, you're going to grow stronger a lot faster. Now, how fast you grow, that is going to be the question because there's some things involved here. First of all, we're talking about a century, which is an endurance event. You're going to be out there for anywhere from five hours if you're just a one excellent cyclist to 10 hours if you're really just out there at 10 miles, basically averaging 10 miles an hour. It'd take you 10 hours to do a century. Now, all of this depends. And like I said, this is your own challenge. So all you're doing is looking at how your body reacts to the training. You're not looking at anybody else's training. So in this video, it's not going to tell you what to do. Because you're going to find that out slowly and surely every single day. Now, there's guidelines that I'm going to give you, but you never... You're not going to, 
you know, you, know, you can always look at, oh, look at this great racer. What's his training re regimen? All I have to do is follow that and I'll be a great racer too. That is the worst advice you could ever give yourself in the, in the history of advice. First of all, if he's a professional racer or she's a professional racer, most likely they were born with incredible amounts of genetics, just beautiful genetics for their particular sport. And like I said, this is an endurance sport. So if you have beautiful genetics, it'll be on the endurance side, which is more ectomorph and, mes and mesomorph. And I've to, I've, if you've seen my other videos, you've seen me describe these. It's important to know what kind of body type you got so you know what you're up against. Endomorphs are very powerful bodies. They are great at power lifting in any kind of sport that involves huge amounts of power, very little endurance. Mesomorphs are the ones in between the ectomorph and the endomorph. They have great strength, great endurance, they're just all around good athletes. And then on the far side of the other scale you have ectomorphs, which I am, which are usually skinny, hard to put weight on, lifting heavy weights, very, very difficult. But doing long rides, doing long endurance vents, that's what you're best at. So if you're an endomorph, the opposite end of the scale, great power, very little endurance, the sentry will be the biggest challenge to you. Now, I've given you the three categories of bodies, but everybody falls in between an infinite amount between those three categories. So a lot of people that uh, gain weight easily and can't get the weight off, they just automatically put themselves into endomorph category, but that may not be the case. It isn't until you've been training for a couple of years well you'll start to realize what, what really body type you are. Because consistent training and, and that perfect lifestyle with great diet will eventually uh, teach you who you are. So there we have the we have the uh, the body types, and you know what you're up against. So if you, you if you've been training a while and you figure, yeah, you go into a gym, you can lift 200 pounds, no problem, but to ride a bike 25 miles is murder on you. Maybe a century isn't even what you want to do as a challenge. It doesn't mean you can't do it. There's plenty of ectomorphs out there that can do it. It's just going to be more of a challenge for you than for the other body types. It'd be like me saying I want to be an Olympic power lifter. I could train all my life, be perfect at everything I do, and still never even come close to qualifying. I just don't have the power. And at the same time, that's why I was an endurance athlete. I had extreme ectomorph, extreme endurance, so I fell right into uh, ultramarathon type races. That worked out just fine for me. But I was granted very little genetics. so. Even though I was an ectomorph, putting myself under intense competition with the best people in the world, well, I didn't do well at all. In fact, uh, my genetics are so bad that racing 3,200 miles nonstop pretty much destroyed my body. It hasn't been the same ever since. That was like 30 years ago, 36 years ago. But 100 miles is not pushing your body past anything really as long as your intelligent training's leading up to it. Pushing your body past that uh, up to 100 miles, that is not going to permanently injure you with intelligent training. Now, if you do stupid training, yeah, you can get injured, and I talked about that before already. So, we've, you've, after, after a couple of years of riding, you may identify your body type. Now, if you're an impatient type, and you just started riding this year, and you go, I'm going to ride a century next year, because you know, I've ridden up to 35, 40 miles this year, and I feel pretty good. I'm ready for a century next year. Well, you probably are. You probably are. Um, if you're feeling pretty good after a 35, 40 mile ride and not coming back completely drained, then yeah, you're ready to up that mileage. And by the end of next year, you know, pick a nice fall century or late summer century, you may be ready. But you're going to be gauging your progress from month to month, and uh, and even though the century comes up, you may not be ready, and you'll have to just wait another year. 
So what kind of training are we going to do for a century? You know, yeah. This video would be very short if the actual person was standing in front of me saying, I want to ride a century. Because then I got, I got their body type, I begin to know their genetics after training, how fast they get strong. And that's, that's one of the ways to tell genetics too. If you were given huge amounts of genetics, just a little bit of training, and not even correct training, you can do incorrect training, and you'll still be getting stronger than everybody else. That's why you never, ever compare your training routine to anybody else. So this whole video is about you're looking at yourself. You're, you're gauging yourself daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly of your advances in cycling to meet this new challenge. And the challenge in itself, you know, it might be a victory. Yes, I did 100 miles, great. But actually the challenge in itself is all the training and the pure lifestyle that gets you there. Because that's what, that's what you hold on to. The century's over in a day. If you want to just do it and then quit and go back to a bad lifestyle, yeah, that's really a bad idea. To just say you did it, that's just, that's just something for the ego. That's, that's, that's just showing off. That ain't nothing. That ain't nothing at all. It's the training. It's the everyday lifestyle. It's the purity. This is what you're going to gain. And once you reach this fitness level, you're not going to want to go back. You're really not going to want to go back because you're going to start feeling so good. I mean, you're up, up, I'm up on top of the mountain today. I don't know, climbed about 3,500 feet on a mountain bike on a trail. Up here in the mountain air, looking out over the scenery. And even though the climb is intense and long and takes over an hour, and it's non-stop climbing, I still just enjoy it. I enjoy, between getting out here in the wilderness and enjoying the fitness, knowing that this ride is making me stronger, this ride is proving, me, tr proving to me at the time too that I am capable of still doing this at 62 years old. So, yeah, there's a certain joy in that. But it's not a competition. I mean, it's not, I'm not, uh, not going to go home and compare myself. Well, who did this ride last? How long did it take them? How fast did they ride it? Just leave that competition out because it's absolutely meaningless. The people that are great at sports were given a gift at birth that they did not earn. They did not earn it. So competitive sports is no different than the, a competition to see who's the tallest. Yes, if you're given good genetics, you'd still have to train hard. You still have to do everything we would have to do but you will be gaining much faster and depending on your level of genetics, that's gonna be placing you in races. Now you could have you know, fantastic genetics and a poor lifestyle and never actually, and still make it to a pro rank, but never do very good simply because you don't have a discipline to do it. And I've known plenty of people that, you know, competing at a high level, you meet people all the time and you see people that have absolutely incredible genetics but they won't train, they don't have the discipline to train. They do extremely well in the races, but they're not winning them because they simply didn't take full advantage, they didn't, they didn't train. So we are training intelligently. We are training at a intelligence that we are looking inward. We're looking at ourselves. we're not looking at anybody else. How did we do today? Did we go for a 25 mile ride? And how well did we do? How well did we feel when we got back? Now, doing this training is not just adding miles. To be complete intelligent training, we're not only training miles, but one day, one day may be faster than another day. One day may be a slower recovery day. Maybe it'll be at a pace that you think you would do your century at, and you do 30 miles. You should be, and then you get back home, you should feel good, even, even though you had a hard ride the day before. If you don't feel good, then you do the same easy ride the next day until you start to feel good. Then you're ready for another harder ride. Now, a harder ride can be high intensity, it can be long distance, or it can be both. And I've said this before, you can either do the mileage at lower intensity, or you can do less mileage at higher intensity and still get to the same place. 
Now you still need to do miles even when you're doing intensity, but you don't have to do as many miles by doing higher intensity work. And by high intensity work, that means heart rates. You're going to be monitoring heart rates. And, um, and everybody should know by now what the maximum percentage heart rate. That is 220 minus your age. You take a percentage of that, six, like 65%, and then that might be your target rate for the day. 65% is like the 60 to 65 is like minimum fitness. That is your, some people call that the fat burning stage. Then you go to 75% and that's more, that's more intense. Um, you're going to be breathing harder. It's not going to be a, a, as much relaxed state. You're going to have to concentrate more on breathing and pedal strokes and everything else. And then you go to 85%. Now you're really working pretty hard. Now you're, now you're probably climbing or you're time trialing or you're pushing pretty hard. And then at 90 to 100%, now you're at 100% you're sprinting. At 90% you may be cresting a hill at 18% grade and just, just working so hard to get over that crest. So the higher heart rates, of course, you don't hold those for very long. So that's so 65, 75, 85%, those are your average distance heart rates. So you'll be following those too as far as you know what your intensity of the day is going to be. So you're going to plan, okay, I'd like to do what's known as long steady distance. And that is, I think I'm going to go for 75 mile training ride a day at 75% maximum heart rate. So you're going to be at a more relaxing heart rate, but you're going to be at a heart rate where it's still working. You're still working the muscles pretty good. You're still working the cardiovascular system pretty good. And you're going for a pretty good distance at 75. The 75 was, is the, is, um, was my target for professional racing. Your target for your century for a long steady distance may be 45. And I keep bringing genetics back. I'm going to pre keep bringing genetics back all the time because it's so important. Like I said, for most of us, we don't have that great genetics. Now, you don't know what you have. If you're just starting out in your fitness, you really don't know what you have. So what you're going to find out is as you start to train on the bike, if you start building up mileage really quick and feeling good while doing it, you know you're going to be at a higher level of genetics. And if you get to the point where uh, after a couple of years of training that these centuries aren't even aren't even a challenge anymore, you can do them laughing, <laughs> then you might want to do something faster or something longer. But for most people, accomplishing a century in six to seven hours is the, is the, it's the best I, I can ever do. I mean, I've been training consistently now for over 50 years, over a half century of consistent training every single year. and. I've never been able to do better in a five-hour century, and my average centuries are always six. So, after 50 years of training, it hasn't really gotten all that much better. Now, that's, that's the physical part and the mental part we've been talking about, and the lifestyle part. Now, the rest of it is, while you're on the bike, there's other kinds of training. There's efficiency training, and with centuries, you want the most efficiency you can get. And I've already just put out a video about how to go farther, longer, and faster, and that'll teach you about efficiency. It's, it's pedal strokes, it's changing positions, it's getting out of the saddle and, and pedaling and stretching, and, and it's all this on the, on the bike type recovery from minute to minute while you're riding. So you're gonna wanna develop as many pedal strokes and variances of pedal strokes that you can use throughout the day, because each time, you use a different pedal stroke, you're using your muscles slightly differently. To use the muscles in the exact same position, and that's what bicycles will do because you got a finite position on over those cranks. The only thing that changes is you can slide back and forth in the seat, you can change the speed of the crank, and you can get out of the saddle and climb, and, uh, climb or just stretch that way. But the bike gives you a very finite changes. So, the pedal stroke, you still got 360 degrees, so you still got the power stroke that everybody knows about pushing down, but you got 
a whole nother set of muscles behind your legs that you can pull through the bottom and up through the back and that's and that's going to relieve a lot of stress off the off the off the power muscles that you've been using pushing down and then you got the, you got muscles on the inside of your leg that'll that help you push across the top of the stroke so as you push across the top of the stroke it's a different muscle from the power stroke and the power strokes are different muscles now they're all being used at the same time to some percentage but as you concentrate on pedal strokes and you and you relax the power stroke a little more and you follow through at the bottom or you're pushing across the top and not using the power stroke as much you're really relieving that big power stroke muscle that everybody likes to use that big power stroke muscle, if you used it all day long for 100 miles, again, you'd have to have really good genetics to get away with that. Me and the rest of us, we can't get away with it. We have to develop pedal strokes so that we can, we can spin for a while, maybe at 100 RPM, and then we change pedal strokes. We go, I'm going to, power, I'm going to pull through at the bottom a little more. I'm going to drop down to 90 RPM or 85 and do those. So that's part of training, too. So not only are you looking at mileage and intensity during those mileages, but you also be, you should have my dedicated. The best days to uh, practice pedal strokes are on the high intensity days because you need high intensity days. You need to concentrate on what you're doing. You, that's not going to be a mindless thing where you're just looking around at nature. So that way you can concentrate on your pedal stroke. And then the other days are the uh, are the really easy days where you can concentrate on it. And then ones in between, which will be most of them probably, those long steady distance days at around 75% of your heart rate, those days you can maybe relax a little bit, look around and look at nature and have some more fun. And being fun is part of it too. So that's basically it. Um, you're going to increase your mileage very, very slowly. If you're riding 25 miles comfortably now, then uh, maybe maybe five miles every two weeks and then you ride you test you, you know, okay the 35s are feeling better and uh, you know you have your you have your test every week you can have one day where you test your century pace you know this is the pace I want to do for this century because I want to do it in so many hours so you do that pace for as many miles as you think you can and then assess that the next two days. Because sometimes you'll be sore two days later, sometimes you'll be sore right after the ride, some days, one day later. So you're, you're assessing that one century pace ride every week. And as you get stronger and you grow and uh, grow in talent from pedal strokes, you will see that increase and be able to increase your miles. And at the end of six months, you may be able to go from 25 to 50 miles. And again, those jumps in how fast you can go is all dependent on your genetics, your intelligence in training, your lifestyle, your diet. If you take all those things into account, it's going to happen as fast as possible. If you leave one of those things out, you may not make it at all. You're going to need everything. For those of us who aren't with the great genetic gifts, you're going to need it all to be able to do that century. Now, uh, a, a week, uh, two weeks before the century, you're going to do your longest ride. At that point, 85 miles should, should be working out pretty well for you. Two weeks before the century, if you can do 80 miles and uh, not have to be, not have to call someone to bring you back home, then you're probably ready for that century. Because that last, that last 20 miles may be something you've never done before, but if you've already done 80 and you've already done 80 at a pace that you wanted to do it at, you've already reached enough knowledge about yourself to know that uh, if you can do that extra 20. That extra 20 may be, may be really really hard at the century and it may take you two hours to do it at an average speed of 10 miles an hour. You may be end up stopping at rest stops and, uh, and 
trying to replenish with sugar and things like that. But that's a whole other story there, because uh, my advice on, on eating on the bike is unlike anybody else in the world. Today, it's, um, it's about, uh, what, about two one, one o'clock in the afternoon, and I haven't eaten all day. I didn't eat any breakfast. I leave, I leave on an empty stomach. I haven't eaten since last night and uh, I take no food with me. I never take food with me. On a long ride, the only thing I would take with me is liquid minerals, and a very, not just any liquid minerals you buy off the shelf, a very specific brand that I know that works, that's been tested by a, by a naturopath doctor. Longer rides, I will take minerals, and it's just, a, it's just liquid minerals. It's just that I take a cap full and I mix it in with my water bottle, and that's it. I, you're starting your training now. You may you may be able to uh, to experiment with this and start your 25 mile rides without any food, without eating before. Start your ride on an empty stomach and go through it. Now the first uh, people have to train their bodies to burn the fat. So this is hard for people. So it's not something you do on the bike first. It's something you do in your lifestyle first. You. You don't eat any simple sugars throughout the entire day. If you want to eat it before you go to bed, that's fine. So save your cookies and cake before you go to bed. And everybody goes, oh, that'll make you fat. Well, maybe, I don't know. But that's the only way to train yourself away from sugar. Because otherwise, if you replenish sugar throughout the day, then you're going to need to replenish sugar on the bike. And that, to me, well, that's unnatural. Obviously, our ancestors weren't doing that. And when you when you... When you look at some of the uh, tribes in Africa, you find out they go days without food on a hunt. They don't, they don't want that food in their stomach slowing them down, and that's why I don't eat it. I moved to this extremely hot environment. It's, it's 100 to 115 degrees every day during the summer. Very rare to get a 95 degree day, except this year, coldest, coldest summer on record probably. Um, so I started, you know, having food in my stomach at, in the morning at the beginning of the ride as, it, as the day heated up didn't work at all. It just made me feel horrible. So I stopped eating and then found out hey, I, don't, I don't need to eat. In fact, I feel a whole lot better. Now, why would I feel a whole lot better? Eating food engages the entire digestive system, solid food engages the entire digestive system, which is probably your biggest energy user in your body. Now, why would you want to engage that before you go out and try and engage in stressful, in a stressful century? Doesn't make any sense, does it? No. So experiment with that too. Experiment with uh, not eating on the bike, especially when you're on your lower mileages. Um, you're gonna, um, as you train your body to do this, the first couple of rides, it'll be called what's bonk. It's, it's, a, it's what people call bonk. You'll, you'll lose all your energy, you just crawl back. But if you try it again the next day, you may find out that um, the body begins to learn how to burn fat pretty darn fast. They know you get out on a bike again and goes, what the body knows, well, you're not getting any sugar this time, so we better start burning fat right now. And then before you know it, you don't need food on the bike anymore. You don't need it for energy. Um, energy supplies come from fat. It's, it's a hydrocarbon. And uh, you don't need sugar. Sugar is 100% unnatural, kind of, to to be eating on the bike. And I believe in total naturalness. I don't believe in any kind of drug or or caffeine or anything to to uh, amp up anything. Because you'll find out when you get off all that stuff, get off the sugar, get off the caffeine, get off all that crap. All of a sudden, my my energy is constant throughout the entire day. As long as I don't eat. As soon as I eat, the energy drops. But um, I can be on the bike for a very long time, up to seven hours, no food, no problems. In fact, a better ride without the food. So this whole craziness about uh, eating, I mean, it's, it's only a six, seven hour ride. You're, you're only out there for six, seven hours. You come back home, you can replenish all the food you want. 
So there's bigger stores on the body than people think. And because people use this unnatural way of replenishing using simple sugars, they think, well, it runs out in 20 minutes. Well, yeah, it does, because it's unnatural, just like any other drug. You have to replenish it more and more and more. And when you do that on a century, you start eating cookies at 20 miles, you start eating more and more cookies, you have to eat more and more sugar by the end of the ride. It's not a, it's not a good way to do a century. So stay natural, stay intelligent on your training, and uh, don't be perfectly consistent. Break things up. Break your training up into different ways. Find out what body type you are. Bring those pedal strokes and efficiency of your bike up. And you'll be riding that century in no time. Thanks again. See you later.